This is challenging work. You know, it kind of rocks our very foundation. And when we start to look and see and tell the truth to us, it can threaten our identities and the roles that we've taken. And particularly us spiritual types, when we start to question like who we are and where am I still being driven by this, it can get a little unsettling. So welcome again. And if you're not feeling some resistance to this work, you're not listening. <laughs> so I'm here to afflict you. I'm here to challenge you. And I'm here to do that for me. Because I want to see what's left of me that would rob me from living in relationship to the divine, to God, coherently with ease and with grace and then to be that to the world. So thank you for those of you who are listening and joining in from all over the world, wherever you are. This is also being recorded today and that fulfills our commitment, my personal commitment and our commitment as a region and sub-region to make this work available to the world and to make it available to folks who are interested in learning a new way of being with us. So um, settle in. Remember, there's nothing serious going on here. So if it starts to look a little too serious, like loosen up, kind of get the cooties off of you, and let's just have a little fun instead. And I'll be moving about a little, and I'm standing up here today on purpose for the quality of the sound and the quality of the video. And I'm committed to bringing the highest quality to what we produce as we can, even though... Um, I notice I want to be down in there with you. So that's the reason for me to be in this position this morning. So we'll start with looking at the tenets of healthy congregations. So this is another worksheet, uh, work, work, worksheet for you. These are all for you to write on, take notes, anything that you can. It's also a bit of a review from last night. So that I want us to take another look together at what the tenets of healthy congregations are. And as we do it together this morning, to actually do it, you remember the little forgiveness exercise we did last night? The checkup on how well we really are willing to reconcile differences? I'd like you to take this journey through this this morning as a bit of a self-assessment for you. Now this means, folks, without the shame, without the blame and without the guilt that we typically heap on ourselves when we really start taking these spiritual journeys. So have you had enough shame and guilt? Have you had enough shame and guilt for the rest of your life? Good. That is not a rhetorical question and I'm really glad that you hear it as that. So all the work we do is no blame, no shame, no guilt. It's just an honest look at really, really, really how well am I re ready to step into kind of a new evolution of this for my being. So this training is open to anyone on a path of self-realization with an interest in developing, leading, and educating. If you're interested in doing healthy congregations workshops like we're doing here and you want to be a facilitator of that, you're welcome to go to the next level of that and come in and be trained as a facilitator. And all that information is available at marthacreek.net for you to find out where and how to do that for 2012. Tenets of leaders in healthy organizations. Persons follow an inner compass. We are guided by our own clear, coherent beliefs, principles, and life goals. So how well would you say that you follow your own inner compass? Yes. Can you kind of catch how quickly we could get caught up into groupthink? Or when the pressures of family or the pressures of relationship, the heat gets turned up on us? how quickly we may fold out of our own fear and uncertainty about what will happen. So get a sense now of what it would be like to follow your own inner compass. Who would you be? What would your life look like 
if you did that. So experience your answer. Who would I be? What would my life look like if I followed my own inner compass? Second one, people take responsibility for themselves. They're aware of their own feelings and they neither blame others, circle that. We do not blame others nor require others to know what we are feeling. We do not hold others responsible for our own feelings. Can you get a sense of how just one of these things applied would transform your life? Just one of these. And then we ask ourselves regularly, what can I learn from this? What can I learn from this situation? And my training through the Lombard Mennonite Peace Center and Healthy Congregations Incorporated, which the websites will be provided for you throughout the, throughout the day somewhere today, that one of my teachers there, Dick Blackburn, said to me, what can you learn? What can you learn? What can you learn? What have you learned? So what can I learn from every situation I'm in? People respond to anxiety. Now this is the opposite of react to anxiety. That means we react to other people's reactions. And what does it get you when you react to other people's reactions? Yes, stress, worry, frustration, irritation. So get a sense of what it would be like to respond to their feelings instead of reacting. We anticipate anxiety. You know that anxiety is a part of it. So we may as well look forward to it. I am willing for anxiety. I look forward to anxiety. You may as well. We then recognize when anxiety gets heightened, when it gets ratcheted up. And then you can know that any time that there's a perceived loss, a change in anything, or a crisis of some sort, then our jobs as leaders become anticipating, recognizing, and then uh, working to lower that anxiety, which could be just listening to folks. People are challenged. We actually allow people to work through their times of stress. So we don't have to jump in to do our patterned way of doing it, like fixing, rescuing. That we give people a process time to actually work through their periods of stress. That means for us, we've got to be more tolerant of their discomfort. So how well would you think you are tolerant of pain in other people when they're suffering? What kind of score would you give you as far as how you tolerate pain? How well do you tolerate pain in yourself? What will you do to quickly shift your own discomfort? instead of just kind of going into that discomfort to see what's this about? What am I thinking here that caused this? And get a sense of what going within would look like instead of going without. And that's what I'm quoted the most for, go within or go without. So this is about a trip in here. We tolerate the discomfort that can go along with these stresses and we understand that this is necessary if we're going to have any significant growth. If change is anything's going to evolve, the next grandest version of ourself is going to be birthed and come through here, pain will be a part of it. So just notice how much aversion you have to pain. And that's the level of our insanity. We actually think we shouldn't have to suffer. 
And what's the reality of it? Since recorded history, what's the, re what's the reality of it? Is there suffering? Yes. yes. So the real suffering is believing there shouldn't be any. So who's putting the suffering on you? Loco. There shouldn't be suffering. Apparently, there should be. Just based on reality. So I don't have to heap another level of it on there by saying there shouldn't be any. Healthy, thriving organizations, people, respect boundaries. They recognize and respect where one person begins and one person's ends. What's, what's my responsibility? What's your responsibility? Then we can agree upon certain roles and structures and positions that we're in, and then we can respect those. So you can respect a minister in a, the role of a minister. Then it's not, a, it's not a proper boundary to think the minister's going to be your best friend. That's not the role they're in. And then what's it like in you when you want the minister to be your best friend and she's not? Where does it leave you? You might just answer it out loud. If you're thinking and believing the minister should be my best friend and she's not, that she should be your best friend and she's not, what happens in you? Rejection. Betrayal, anger. Yes. Now, who would you be if you understood her role? And that her role is not that. How would that be inside of you? Say it again. Comfortable. More comfortable. Sane. <laughs> Confident. Empowered. Like focused. Following my own inner compass. So it sounds little. And these little bitty things here go a great long way in your life. Now imagine what energy that would free up for you if you simply stopped trying to create, trying to make something happen that's not possible to happen. If you threw in the impossible towel. There's also, when we respect boundaries, there's less and less pressure to go along with a group. That you know where you stand on a matter, and then you know why you stand there. What is your conviction to this? And you don't have to give up where you stand on a matter to go along with a group and where they stand. And then in healthy congregations, people stay in contact. Now this is interesting here. We resist tendencies to distance and to cut off from those who we disagree with. Now, what if you could stay in contact with the people that disagree with you? If just because we disagree doesn't make them an enemy to me. Can you get a sense of it? of actually staying in touch with them and then understanding the value of the disagreement. How interesting would it be here if we all believed the same thing? What do you think would ever happen if we all believed the same thing? And then we work together for a sufficient amount of time. We give some time and interest and energy to maintaining those relationships. So that means if you cut off from me, we disagree, that I can be the one to reach out to you. Say, you know, Darlene, I know that we disagree on that. And I'm really committed to staying in relationship with you. I don't want the fact that we disagree to dissolve the relationship that we have. So for now we disagree and I'm absolutely committed to staying in relationship with you. I'm not gonna let my old patterned way of being run my show here. You know how in our families we cut off? You know, the minute you turned 16 or 18, you were out of there. Right? Yeah, that's what we're still doing. 
So that's the tendency to either cut off or to actually enmesh. So when they itch, we scratch. So that's the polar ends of it. So we're looking for a more of a middle ground on this. And then the bottom are the traits that we went over last night. They're just in a different format. So as we go through these, we'll do, a, we'll do kind of a comparison. So I'll start down the left-hand column, which is called surviving traits, and the right-hand column, thriving traits. Now, just if you want to be surviving or you want to be thriving, just get a sense of what that one word does for you. How does it feel to think you're surviving? I see your head shaking. Like, what's it like? Say it out loud. Yes. Tense and dense and heavy. Now, what's it feel like to take the concept of thriving? Expansive. Expansive. Broader. Like a little light comes in. A little opening here. So, very powerful differences. So, deny differences or accept differences. Yes. Accept differences. Can you see how it's more reality based? You may as well. <laughs> or you can suffer some more. So I believe you're here to end suffering. That's what I'm here for. So I believe that naturally you are too. So the longer we keep denying differences, the more suffering we get and the more we bring to the world. To focus on weaknesses. Remember last night we used the example of you'll go home and go, look at their socks on the floor. <laughs> I told you I had cameras in your house. <laughs> Instead of what went right here. What can I be grateful for? So a focus on strengths. And that means a complete retraining of our mind. Because it absolutely is patterned to zoom in on what doesn't work well. What didn't go right. Where did I didn't get my way? And then focus on what are the issues. What are the issues? We have issues. It's like... You don't. You have a crazy mind that calls things issues. And we can either send it down that path or we can send it down a path of what's my mission? What am I here to do? So the difference is what I can't do or what I can do. Now get a sense if, if that was your MO for today. What can I do? What mission am I on today? Who do I want to be here today? and the difference that would be to your life. Deny that conflict exists. Go ahead. Versus working to reduce it, working to, the word here is manage, and just this past week I thought I've got to quit using that word because it sounds like you can manage a fire burning. And to a degree you can, and then to a degree you can't. The, life ha the fire has its own life. So conflict is always burning. This is about managing in a way that you can manage what's going on in you. Lower your own anxiety here. Manage the conflict that's internal conflict so that then you may have more presence to which you can bring some improvement to the fire by you stop throwing gas on it. Instead of depending on our skills and our techniques and our intellect, we start to just increase our groundedness, increase our functioning, increase our presence and how we can be more present to somebody, particularly when they don't agree with us. Kind of hard to do, right? Because when they don't agree with you, what happens in you? Get louder, try to convince them, seek, th seek for them to understand you, instead of seeking to understand them. So little bitty things here that can go a long way. In the surviving traits, stewardship is begrudged. Like, I'm guilted into giving. I hate this. I have to do this. Boy, 
what if I didn't have to do that, then I could do that. Versus I give out of gratitude. I give out of willingness. I give out of the mission that I'm living for my own life. And understanding the energy of money, then I put money toward things that matter to me. Very simply, I give money to things that matter to me. And we're caught in some pretty powerful traps there. Because we're still putting money to places that don't really matter to us. At the end of the day, it's like, look back. Now imagine you're dead. And look back on your life. And it's all one of those little graphs. You know the little graph bar graphs that measures? And imagine what your graphs would look like with where your money went. And what kind of feeling do you get when you look back and see where your money went? How would that feel? It's like, oh, less trips to Starbucks. <laughs> I don't know what yours is. I just know that really came, actually I don't drink coffee at all. This is not personal to Starbucks, by the way, because I don't drink coffee. This comes from an experience I had of somebody taking a real issue with me because she heard me say in a Sunday lesson that all things are possible. And she took real issue with that. And she wanted to go on the cruise we were doing as a group. And she said, stop saying that because you don't know my circumstances. I cannot go. I cannot go. I cannot go. I cannot go. I don't have the money to go. And I didn't believe her. It's just that simple. She believed what she was thinking. I didn't believe what she was thinking. And I don't know a thing about her. I don't know her circumstances. But eventually she brought in her little spreadsheet of her income and expenses and asked me to look at them. And I said, I would. And like, what's this line item? And she said, you want me to give up cable? I said, lady, I don't want you to give up anything. You asked me to look at this. So you want cable more than you want a cruise. She said, the truth is, I don't even watch it. My TV's not on one time in a month. Then I said, what's this line item? The newspaper. You want me to give up a newspaper? I don't care what you give up. You asked me to look at this. She said, the truth is, I don't even read it. I pick it up on the front porch and put it in a recycle bin. It does not even come in my house. You with me? Then she had a light item for free spending, which I've coached people over the years that are on a financial plan to have free spending money for yourself, because if you don't, you'll resent having a financial plan and won't adhere to it. And she had $400 or some, in my mind, astronomical amount of money a week in there. And I asked what it's about, I mean a month, so $100 a week, $100 a week. <laughs> And she said, I said, what is this? And she said, I am not giving up Starbucks. <laughs> and I said, I'm not asking you to give up anything. And it was $7 a day for some loaded up coffee and a scone. And she was claiming she wants to lose weight. So it was long story bearable. That was about $1,600, whatever she was spending. And the cruise was $700. So... Where, where is it going that really doesn't interest us? And then what could we do with that money that would really interest us? That we would look back on our life and go, that's what I did with that money. Now that is who I came here to be. That's what I want to do with the money that I have stewardship for. Surviving, we react judgmentally and dishonestly. So how many of you are judgmental? Raise your hands. Hey, everybody up. <laughs> you just, come into, just come into some understanding that of course you're judgmental. That's what the mind does 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even in our dreams, we're still judging them. We're still judging even in our dreams. So are we judgmental? Yes. Do we have to believe the judgments? No, no. 
And the pain is not in the judgment. The pain is in us attaching to that and actually believing the thought that occurred to us. And then we act dishonestly because we're afraid of being judgmental. Says, are you judgmental? Oh, no. No, I go to unity. We're open. It's like, there's one. (laughs) Everything's a judgment. Open's a judgment. Up is a judgment. Diverse is a judgment. Up, down, black, white, tall, short, fat, skinny, rich, poor. It's all judgment. And then we've made judging wrong. Versus it's just mind activity. And then, you know the scripture about it? Usually as far as we go is judge ye not, comma, what's the rest of it? Lest ye be judged. Lest you understand that the judgment you have about that is on you. So that's the mirror. So yes, you'll judge and understand that all the judgment is about you. So the workshop tomorrow afternoon will get into these judgments and our belief systems and how to excavate them and then, as far as I know, take them out, take them down. This is where we also blame others and then we blame ourselves, Because the mind has to attack something. So it'll attack somebody, it'll attack an organization. My mind attacks, attacks technology. So for those of you listening, just so you know, I tacked the technology last night for you. (laughs) Now, guess what that got me? Distraction. Stress. Like a tantrum toward God, toward life. Like, I know the technology should have worked 100%. Like, I run the world. (laughs) So God, please consult me to see when it could work and shouldn't work. (laughs) Then who needs God when you've got me to run the world? (laughs) Who needs God you to run the world? Instead of what is reality? It worked the way it did. Did we like it? No. Do we wish it had been different? Yes. What's the reality of it? Then how can I awaken to reality? Hmm. Hmm. What can I learn from this situation? And then I can apply what I learned for the next round. And then surviving, we act selfishly and competitively. That means if you've got it, I can't have it. Or if you get it, there's less for me. Versus this is a collaboration here. Just because you have it doesn't mean I won't get what is mine. No one and no thing can stand between me having what is mine. Reality. God reality. Versus this thinking it knows how everything ought to be. So I want to show you um, a little DVD. So this is a... PowerPoint of churches, their billboards. So there, I've just got a few kind of funny ones we'll read as we go into it. <laughs> Can you relate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I really like this one. It wasn't a part, it's not a church billboard, but I love it so much I had to put it in because of how much in my life I've had a woodpecker on board (laughs) because of my um, um, fixing and rescuing and running other people's lives and knowing the life they should live. And if they would just listen to me, and a spiritual path is so much better than an alcoholic path. And if they could just awaken to that. Oh, guess who should awaken? The one that can. Yes. 
<laughs> Can you see her name from where you're sitting? Reverend Lush. <laughs> We've all tried that, right? And we're so shameful and guilty about not going to church, we even lie about it. Did you go to church Sunday? Yes. Well, I didn't see you. Well, I was there. Yes. You go on Sunday? Yes. We even do surveys in churches. And we have them to mark how often do you attend Sunday services at this particular church. Um, like almost never, routinely, almost always. Something like that. And almost always is the block that's checked. Never mind, in physical reality, they were there twice in a year. <laughs> this is the power of this. There's so much shame and guilt about admitting that we don't go, that we actually lie about going. <laughs> are you getting a sense that these are in the South? <laughs> Can you see what it says? This is how you know if a Catholic is driving too fast. Jesus is actually clutching the cross. <laughs> so this is a little paradigm shift, wouldn't you say? So now this starts these church um, wars, so to speak. They literally are two churches, two denominations sitting directly across the street from one another. In physical reality, it's like church one, church two. The billboard says, all dogs go to heaven. This is the, this is the Lady of Martyrs Catholic Church. <laughs> all dogs go to heaven. Now here's the Presbyterians across the street. Okay, can you get a sense of where this is going? So as we take the trip through this, really enjoy it. It is very funny. And also look at how we do it. So this is how the little ping pong thing works. This is a little you know, tit for tat, waiting for their move so you can make one. So just gently and compassionately catch yourself in it as you go. God loves all his creations, period, dogs included. So you kind of getting a sense of how we're amping up a little here? I'm right, you're wrong, period. Like this line's drawn. <laughs> Catholic dogs go to heaven. Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. A bigger line is drawn. You got it? Dogs don't have souls. This is not open for debate. What part of your wrong do you not get here? <laughs> Free dog souls with conversion. Did you get the loop? Yeah. Now, what got, so where are, we, where are we now? Ready for round two. Right back where we started. 
right? Quite a bit of energy expended. Yes, so let's unravel today. Let's just do it without the stress. Let's just let's let, lose our stripes, so to speak. Peace begins with me. What can I do in the Christ spirit? And who would we be if we understood the divinity of everyone? And if we look closely enough to see that divinity in them. So it's a beginning. So this video is a case study. So this is a congregation that brought some change into their congregation. And we'll see two versions of the very same circumstances. Okay, do you understand that? So when people see this, there's such a difference in the second viewing that they think the circumstances were different. The circumstances are the same. What's different, what's different is these folks function differently. So the first time through, we're going to be looking at an anxious congregation. We're going to be looking at a congregation that's bringing some change to the congregation. We're looking at a congregation that's bringing a new vision and mission uh, objective to the forefront. This is who they claimed they're here to be. And then they brought action to meet that mission and vision. And they're standing in the repercussions of the change. They're standing in the resistance to the change. So now you're the church consultants. Okay? So you've been hired to come in here to point out all their problems. Okay, so you're watching from, now what are the problems? So that's number one. How would you define the problem? Be looking from the context of who could have functioned differently in a way that would have made a difference. So we're just working with questions one and two. You might even fold your paper if that helps you to keep it kind of more clear. We're working with the top half, questions one and two. And then, also as you watch, see which one of them is more like you. Which of these characters would be likely be the way you would handle this, so to speak? A gentle look, no shame, no blame, no guilt, just that is me right there. Let's worship God together now. This is terrible. This is supposed to be a church, not a nightclub. Make a joyful noise to God. Finally, they've done something I like. Make a joyful noise to God. Coming to that service is going to mean just a lot less people coming to the regular service. Wasn't that great? It's good to see all of you here today. We're experimenting to see whether a contemporary service will attract new members or even people who don't find much meaning in traditional forms of worship. We're not replacing our Sunday worship. We're simply adding a worship service put to a contemporary setting. Right. I don't find it at all appealing, but I know the pastor's been pushing for it ever since he came here. I think he's got the leaders of the church fooled. Believe me, he's got the charm to get what he wants. It began as a congregation's vision. They wanted to reach out to the community with a worship service that was contemporary and appealing. But what was well-intentioned went astray. What was designed to help the congregation grow became the focus of its current distress. So what happened? I've been trying to figure it out, and I can't. I did it right, by the book. I brought up the idea at a worship committee meeting and got their approval. Then I took it to the governing body and got their approval. We made it a part of our vision for the future. Finally, when we actually get the service going, all I began to hear was negative comments. I don't know whether it's me they're reacting to or finally introducing something contemporary in the, uh, what, 
the inertia that's been here for years. I don't know. You thought they were in agreement on this, and now you feel as though they've gone back on their word, pulled back from their commitment? It's almost like a betrayal. Well, it's a little bit strong, but <laughs> we're now against each other instead of being together. There's tension, and I find it so hard to talk to the volatile critics. I don't know what to make of it. In talking with the pastor, he indicated his distress. The worship committee approved the contemporary service. The leaders included in their vision plans. Yet it's had such a negative reaction. Can you explain what's happened? Well, a committee isn't the same as a whole congregation, you know. Yes, we gave him permission to try out a contemporary service, but we had no idea how it was going to be received. Which means you're not feeling very good about your decision? Well, I'm not the kind of person who likes tension. Uh, in fact, my wife um, reminded me about what we went through when we built the addition onto our church building. People voted for it, but some of them left because they didn't think we needed the extra space. Like now, a lot of people didn't like what was going on. A lot of people? Well, enough people. I'm beginning to worry whether we did the right thing or not. Well, I don't like what's going on. I've talked to the Millers and the Thompsons and some of the others, but they're talking about leaving with all this going on. I know that as a committee we gave permission to the pastor to go ahead with this contemporary worship thing, but there's been a lot more negative reaction to it than any of us ever anticipated. The fact is, uh, this whole thing is getting out of hand. Look, if they're going to get this upset about something so minor, then who needs them? I say let them go. They've been members here longer than you have. Why, they have a right to say how they feel. Fine, let them say it and then leave it at that. But as soon as they start threatening to quit just because they're not getting their own way, well, that's just wrong. Well, if you appreciated them more for what they've done for this church, if you didn't always fall all over the pastor, well, maybe I we'd all be better off. All too. Hey, hey, to... hey, let's not start getting personal about all this. Our job is to find a way to make everybody happy without offending or losing anyone. I'm certainly willing to listen to any suggestions. I think we're making a mountain out of a molehill. Why don't we just ignore it? I think this will all blow over pretty soon. Oh, no, it won't. I tell you what we've got to do is we've got to go to Pastor Stetson and have him talk to Pastor Johnson. After all, he's retired, but Pastor Stetson still knows what's best for this congregation. Yes, he does. I don't know. That sounds pretty divisive. Why don't we all just go right to the pastor with our concerns? You, you really think he's going to back down once he gets something new like this started? No, I, I tell you, we've got to go to Pastor Stetson. He's the best one to talk to him. Will you people please make up your minds? First you give pastor permission to conduct this new service, and then as soon as there's a complaint, you want him to stop. Are we going to support him or not? That's not the problem. The thing we've got to address here is how we keep this from destroying a church that we all love. We've got to do something or else it will tear the church apart. Your discussion ended with you making a plea to everyone to work toward a workable solution. Did you find one? Not yet. I'm afraid it's come to the point where I can't handle it. As far as I can see, the pastor is going to have to deal with it as best he can. After all, he started it in the first place. There's quite a turmoil in the congregation, and I understand you're in touch with what's going on. How did you become central to the whole thing? Well, I'm past president of the church, and people know me and trust me. They know they can talk to me. And what do they talk about? Well, they're upset. They don't like what's going on. Now, I don't feel one way or the other about Pastor Johnson, but I do know that he's forcing change down people's throats. Well, frankly, I don't like that, and a lot of others don't either. And so people are turning to you for leadership? That's right. I'm going to get to the bottom of this and get something done. I know a lot of important people that will throw their weight behind me. Well, it, it's becoming pretty clear that the reason the pastor has started this whole thing is that he would like to have more young people and families in the church. And they're saying that 
he really doesn't care for us older people at all. The worship service is out of hand. Well, some of us don't like what's going on. This was your church for 21 years, and everyone knows you and trusts you. You've got to go to Pastor Johnson and talk some sense into him. We need to decide what we're going to do about this. We're going to get together over at Jane's house later, but we don't want anybody else to know about it. So if you could kind of keep it under your hat, that would be great. It feels like they're going to make us do it their way. Old people just can't seem to deal with anything different. I was at that committee meeting, and I asked them why they gave Pastor permission to do it in the first place. And the sneaky part, the part that made me so mad, was that they said, oh, we never gave him permission to do it at all. He just went ahead and did it on his own. Sounds to me that things are spiraling and getting out of hand. Oh, that's right. We're getting more and more divided. The problem is there's no real leadership. Well, that's where I come in. I've got to be more assertive. The church must be saved. And what do you mean by saved? Well, there's got to be a firm decision. You're a hard man to find. You've got to work off your tensions. When I'm uptight, I work out a lot. That helps me. I'm a peace agree type. You know, keep it cool. This church is making a nervous wreck out of me. Well, leadership isn't easy. <laughs> Boy, you got that right. There's no one in the world who wishes someone else had this job more than I do. Well, why do you say that? These people are my friends. I live with them, work with them, play with them, worship with them, have all my life. They're not bad people. They just don't agree on everything. I can't go to them and tell them not to feel what they're feeling. What's wrong with just letting everything go back to the way it was? That's what I'm saying. I'm not going to sit around and let this fighting go on. I'm going to see to it that there's some resolution. A bunch of us have gotten together and we're going to demand that the congregation meet and put an end to this. Well, that's what she asked me. I assured her that I would be here to help put the pieces together again. These are really good people. It's a shame and we need to pray that they do the right thing. I went along with the prayer part. Prayer is wonderful. But when he said that the pastor is against older people, well, that's not true. Like he didn't agree with that. And as far as I'm concerned, he is really against us older ones. And you know what else? What really makes me mad is that he spends all his time on this crazy worship service when he should be doing what he's supposed to be doing. He needs to be out raising money. I'm telling you, if they call a congregational meeting, or if they try to let that retired pastor of theirs take over, or if they try to stop that worship service, well, Merle and I have a whole lot of talking to do. I mean, we're not going to put up with a bunch of inflexible, selfish people who just, oh, I don't know, I am just so upset about this. This is all so sad. All they would have had to do was call him up and explain, and none of this would have happened. How vicious. I'm the target of everything. Everybody blames me like it's all my fault. Well, they want to play tough. I'll play tough. What if it just doesn't go away? What if it grows into something that finally tears the church apart? I don't think it will. We're all people of faith here. And if we have enough faith and can pray about it, it will work itself out. You'll see. Pastor, perhaps you can explain what's going on. Your people showed up at the contemporary morning service. The tension at the late service was noticeable, and there's a general sense of unease. The turmoil that has been building with a few people is now affecting a much larger group of people. People are choosing sides, and others are boycotting things they don't agree with. And the leadership of the congregation has been very slow to act. Well, what now? How does this get resolved? Well, I don't think there can be any resolution. From the way I see it, either I have to leave or the unhappy people have to leave, which is unlikely, or we have to stop the contemporary service, which will make another group of people unhappy, those who want to reach out and bring other people in. Well, what about you? What are you going to do? I don't know. I'm tired and I'm frustrated. How could it go this far? How could it get so intense? 
how the situation is going to end is unclear. One thing that is clear is what began as a relatively small issue has widened into an issue that threatens to undercut the vision and stability of the congregation. I believe the pastor's questions are right on target. How could it get this far? How could it become so very intense? Did it have to happen this way? You're ready. Just call out something that you would see as part of the problem. Say it again. Power struggles. Rigid. Triangulation. What was yours, honey? Yes, a victim, a victimization. And, the dra and then what happens after the victimization, the dramatization of it. Did you catch that in the pastor? Vicious. I'm the, a lack of clarity about the purpose. Like when the anxiety got up, they didn't reference their mission at all. It was about feelings. They went, got caught right up in the emotional field instead of what was our mission here. Good, what else? Yes. Either or thinking. Yes. We've got to make people happy, keep people happy, and then reacting when that wasn't the case. Yes. Not a clear process for how to deal with things like this. So then you would anticipate this is going to happen. There was no process for it. This is like we were just blindsided by this. Like instead of understanding as leaders, resistance comes on the heels of change. Any change. What else? Yes. Yes. Change my stripes. Now you think that's impossible to do. But it's like I've worked with churches where they had a congregational vote with are we going to leave this building and go to that building? All in favor, vote. Majority rules, off we go to the other building. Then it's like they quit the church because they moved to the other building, even though they voted to move to the other building. <laughs> so that's how quick the mind is changing in this. So the same here. It's like, oh, I'll vote for it until the heat gets turned up. And then it's like, I become somebody else instead of standing in the decision that I made. Anybody else? What else do you notice? Well, there weren't any clear goals as to what they were supposed to accomplish with this. And then nobody looked at the positive. You know, if you were there to get the young people, did it work? Yes. So they didn't look at what positive has come from this. They didn't measure the objectives they set out to accomplish. What was yours here? There was no real leadership. There was a committee and a leader of the committee, and what did he do? He didn't want conflict. And he said, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. And then what did he do? This is the pastor's problem. So here goes the pastor under the bus. After all, he did this. So sabotage, scapegoating, blaming, yes, 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 enlisting, trying to build factions. You got that? Build factions, come with us, be on our side. Then enlisting the former pastor which means also dumping the responsibility somewhere where it doesn't belong, not to mention complicating things by getting a former pastor involved. But he was willing to be involved. Yeah. Yes. Now, what would you call that? Yes. What, you, do you remember what he said? Of course. I'll be there to help pick up the pieces. So we get to be in the rescuer, the fixer, the savior role. Add martyr to it. Good. Yes. Yes. So he, they still see it as his congregation, and he's still going along with that. Yes. We have several people that want to be 
be one to save the best yes. situation. The past president, did you get her genie? Genie, the large woman genie, the past president, I've got to take charge, put a stop to this. I know what to do, and I know a lot of people. Did you catch that a few times? A lot of people think, a lot of people will. Uh huh. Yes. Ta da! Cape. Yes. What about the uh, current president, the man with the basketball? Denial. Peace at any price. Yes. Yes. And what about the um, African American woman wearing glasses, kind of uh, frosted white hair? What was her position, if you had to name it? Ignore it. Ignore it. It'll just blow over. Now that's much more difficult to deal with in a system, folks, than conflicted people, than people that are really uh, at it. Because like, you ex at least see what you're dealing with. To do this ignore business and sweep under the rug business is much more detrimental to systems sometimes than the actual just coming at it conflict is because you, just, you don't even know it's there. You don't know what's under the rug, so to speak, till we start tripping over it. Good. She was making the suggestion that they all go and talk to her. Yes, yes, yes. So she suggested let's all go directly to the pastor on this. And then when she got, um, what do you call it, like a non-agreement, remember how he responded? Like, oh no, he would never listen. Or you think he's, he's so stupid he wouldn't, if he's so stupid enough to do this, he sure wouldn't listen to us. So she didn't, couldn't stand where she stood on that. So she folded her own position. Yeah. So good to notice. Now, who could have functioned differently in a way that would have made a difference for the better? Yes. So in this table group that you're in, be very specific about this. So kind of look back in it. Who could have functioned differently? Everybody. So kind of take the characters one by one and give some suggestions, like you're the church consultant, for exactly what they could have done different. What would have been a healthier response? What would have been a healthier action? Based on just the short bit that we've learned, last night and today, referencing even your handout, what are some specific things this system, this congregation, this group of leaders could have done specifically to have made a difference for the better? So just talk about it in your table group. We'll take about just five or six minutes to do this and see what you can come up with and then we'll bring it and flesh it out to the large group. Pause, pray, and proceed. You get the special prize of the day. Wait till you see what it is. Pause, pray, proceed. What else? Start in the beginning, a clear, agreed upon mission. And then a plan to inform the congregation, and as a part of that, speak to the obvious that we know some of you, it's changed. Yes, a plan to speak to the congregation, owning and addressing and validating that we know this is going to be upsetting to some of you. And that would require having healthy conflict norms. Yes. That requires having healthy conflict norms and some practice at that. Uh -huh. and keep pointing people back to the mission. Yes. 
Keep pointing people back to the mission. Keep pointing people back to the mission and don't get caught up in the drama and the dramatizations and the victimizations and the blaming. So as leaders, that's our role. Will it occur? Yes. And what is our role and responsibility here? A different path for that. Good. What else? Was her hand here? Something? <laughs> yes. Ditto and amen. All right. Perhaps they were able to change how they talk about a process for how the change would be implemented. Before we implement a change that we define up front and agree upon a process for how, what we're going to use as we navigate this trail here, that this will require some process and that we have that as clearly defined up front as we do how we're, what we are going to change. Good. Some kind of communication um, method. How yes. How do you communicate all along? Yes. A communication method that we define up front for how we're going to keep this communication going all along. An open communication. Yes, what kind of communicating did they do? Secretive, underground, sideways, telephone, telefax, tele-others. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And don't tell. Yes. Versus, you know, the pastor came out and said, this is a trial whatever his word for it, here's we're testing a new service. And then it's like, that was never mentioned again. Like, you know the rules. In marketing, you got to set six times, six ways, six different formats of saying it, and then a third of us can hear it. <laughs> six times, six ways, and then anticipate one third heard it. So when the minister set it up in the beginning, it was presented as you get to judge this. You get to kind of decide about this. So what else is a possibility there for how to put that out on a different foot? Guidelines. Here's how you would evaluate it. Also, you voted on this. We have brought into action what you as a congregation agreed that you wanted to meet our mission and vision. And these are the expected results. That this is what, this is the wonderful things we're expected to come from this. Yes, so stating that up front. Is that what you mean, yeah. Trenda? Yeah, that we would state that up front. That you decided and here's the outcomes we're going for. Here's what we have in mind for this. Yes, and can we turn our attention to that? Can we focus on what it is we're seeking as an outcome here? We're anticipating good result. Open to suggestions. Yes. Open to suggestions about what's working and what's not working. Like literally, how can we adjust our sales here? Yes. It was only a change of one service. Yes. Accentuate the positive, which would mean give options to people so less black and white thinking. So if this doesn't work for you, what else here might work for you? And even say if this doesn't work for you because we know it will not work. Yes. For you. Yes. That's the whole point because yes. is not working for others. Yes. To so to keep saying we had have anticipated up front that we know this will not work for some of you, even the ones of you who voted for it. When it actually occurs, you will have changed your mind. And keep repeating, because even the six times, six ways is insufficient. And keep repeating. Multiple redundant communication. Multiple redundant communication. And that's like a skill and strategy. So there's nothing wrong with that. Just count on it not working. <laughs> so then you can keep your presence and functioning where you want it, regardless of how many times you've said it and how many ways you've said it, that you can still 
not get caught up in it yourself, possibly. Yes. Yes. Well, for some of us. In this case, it looks like that they could have had a more direct communication with the minister that, as a committee than they had. Because it was like talking about like an outside party or an outside process versus we are the process here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, so we don't know what happened. We don't know if their objectives actually got met, honey. Yeah, and how did the young man deal with it? Yes, yes. So his enthusiasm lasted about how long? Yes, about five minutes. Uh -huh. Discussions ahead of time about the larger project. What's going to be the impact of the changes made at this service even to the other service, even though they're not playing the instruments, the instruments would be there. So there's change to that service, whether you think there's change to that service or not. I didn't see food anywhere. Yes. <laughs> now you're really on to the problem. Mm -hmm. Nobody passed any bagels around. So let's move into, <laughs> thank you for the input, wonderful, wonderful application of, of what we've learned. Now let's shift this to, when have you in your congregation experienced a similar situation? How did you get caught, like some of the people in the video, and then secondly, what ways did you do it well? So you might start with three rounds. When did you experience a similar situation? What was it? How did you get caught in it? Specifically, so this is like confession. <laughs> gentle, gentle, compassionate, compa you know, like, you know, that was me. That was me. I had a minister just a few weeks ago that said that was, I was that board president of Jeannie you know, the past congregational president, that was me in my congregation before I was a minister. So that's real reflection. Now that's exactly what I don't want on my board today, and that's who I was being back then. And then we'll go into what did we do in the same situation, that very specific situation, what did you do well? What would work? So this is going to be a time also for you to share with the folks at your table some things you've learned and what you can pass on as far as, you know, this is experience I think we can draw on. Okay, any questions about the exercise? Specific situation in your ministry, where did you get caught and what worked? What did you do well in that same specific situation? So have a little chat, raise your hand if you get stuck or have questions, I'll be there and we'll take just about 10 minutes to do this. I'll leave the questions up so you can refer to them as your focus.